Welcome to this episode of Revelations from Heaven. My guest today, Anthony Reedberg, has, um, well, he has some things to share with you that, quite frankly, I have not heard, but I completely believe they resonate within my spirit. He's going to make sense of some mysteries to you uh, vis-a-vis his experience, both as a youth and growing up, so that the Lord miraculously revealed the meaning behind what God had had told him in, in vis-a-vis a vision uh, that he didn't understand until about from uh, the age of 15 to 32 when it was revealed to him. It has to do with the New Jerusalem. It has to do with an experience initially that he had in hell. And then this New Jerusalem that he saw, he w- well, I'll suffice it to say, Anthony, welcome to our show. We are in for the ride of our life. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's an honor to be on your show. Well, the honor is all ours and certainly all mine. And Anthony, so we'll, we're starting with hell. I love these uh, stories where God takes us from hell, brings us to heaven, and your journey as a young person sadly brought you to this place in hell so why don't we start there and and what happened as a, as a child well the journey begins when my dad was driving up the coast up towards a place called nambor i'm from uh, brisbane in queensland and he picked up a hitchhiker and the hitchhiker got in the back of the car and sowed a seed in my dad's heart the hitchhiker spoke to my dad about the kingdom of heaven, that the kingdom of heaven is coming to this earth and would take over the whole earth and all the nations of the world would then become those of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, my dad couldn't let that go. My dad claims that when he stopped the car, the hitchhiker got out and then when my dad turned around, he was gone. So my dad then, uh, I think his brother watered that seed. My dad got born again. He took me when I was 15 years old to a Pentecostal church, a mission called Reach Out for Christ by Steve Ryder, the evangelist. Um, I remember being scared because there was a, a presence in that meeting of holiness. And I uh, remember when I got born again, we went up the front to give our lives to Jesus Christ. I was never the same again. But I had an after-death experience around that time, uh, which really shook me. Um, The first thing that happened was my dad told me that if the devil comes to steal the seed to claim the blood of Jesus, and that actually happened in the darkness, I saw a dark figure come, and then I just kept saying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, and then that thing scurried away. This particular experience, it was, I was in my room. I was 15 years old. I was on the top bunk bed. My brother was on the bottom bunk bed. And I literally came out of my body. I could, I was floating in the bedroom and I saw my body lying on the bed. And I'm thinking like, I'm here how can I be in two places at once? Oh, I see. Body, soul, spirit, I get it. The real us. Praise the Lord. So I was floating in there, but then a call came over, and it it was scary. I felt a very evil presence, and when I looked around the room, it was lit up like fire. And I thought the house was on fire. Now, being out of my body, I didn't walk. I floated down the hallway and into the lounge room. And at the base of the lounge room walls were these large orange flames on the outside. I thought the house was on fire. Like I said, there was a pole over the house. And later, years later, I understood from the word of God Why would that happen? Because the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 14, verse 9, hell from beneath is moved for thee to meet thee at thy coming. 
those that are going to hell, hell literally comes up to meet you. I then realized what was happening. I fell down through the floorboards of the house, feet first, and was falling down a dark tunnel. As I was falling, the lights of the earth disappeared. I kept falling and falling, and it was darkness so thick you could cut it with a knife. Darkness that can be felt like pea soup fog. And then I entered into, well, I was hit by three bellows. The Bible describes about the pains of death. I think that's what it was. And the feeling was more emotional. It was though every type of pain and disappointment and discouragement and hurt hit me at one time in three bellows, like waves. And it caused me to literally tears to squirt out of my eyes. You know, the Bible talks about weeping and gnashing of teeth. Tears squirted out of my eyes and I, I gnashed my teeth. I grinded my teeth. I thought my teeth were going to break. And then I went down into an eerie cavern. And as soon as I entered the cavern, I knew when you're out of, out of your body, you know things that you wouldn't normally know. I knew exactly where I was. It was a way station to eternity. At this point, Anthony, you had fallen through the floor. That's right. You were out of your body now. You were in this afterlife, cascading down to hell. A dark tunnel. A dark tunnel. And through that dark tunnel was en route to where? It wasn't hell. It was a cavern alongside of hell. Mm. It, I, I knew that. It, hell was right there. I was in a cavern that ran alongside of hell and it was a way station to eternity like a, a some kind of a transit lounge and in there there was like a tractor beam that was pulling me along now when i looked up it was just black darkness to my right is a wall a the wall of hell and it was made out of mixed flesh it was it was disgusting now, the strange thing is that uh, Herodias, a medieval painter from the Netherlands, had visions of hell and drew body, painted hell as a body deep in the earth. And Mary Baxter said the same thing, mm -hmm. that hell lies as a body deep in the earth. So this makes sense to me. The wall was made out of mixed flesh as though all the different types of uh, nations Brown, black, white, yellow, all mixed together in the wall, and uh, it uh, it was it was it was a very eerie cavern, and something was pulling me toward the end of this cavern. I should have mentioned prior to this. Now I'm sorry, I have to backtrack a little bit. The reason I got saved is because my dad took me and he shook me. And he pointed me to the word of God, to John chapter 3, verse 3. And he said, Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of heaven. He said to me very directly, he said, you're going to hell. <laughs> I was mm. scared. I just, I couldn't let it go. I got to get born again. I don't want to go to hell. And I kept praying that night, uh, the Our Father and the Hail Mary, because I was raised Catholic. So I didn't know that the second half of the Hail Mary is unscriptural. The first half comes from scriptures. The second half is unscriptural. But the thing is that my heart uh, was open and uh, crying out for God to forgive me. Now we get to this part. Everything that happened to me, I can find scriptures for it. I saw these coming towards now the end of this cavern were these scary shadows. Like, like I couldn't, I'd, I'd, I've never seen anything like that before these wide shadows, which to look into was a piercing pain into the soul. And, it's, and when I looked into them, again, with the crying, the weeping and the gnashing of teeth, and the Bible says in Job chapter 38, verse 17, have the gates of death been opened unto thee, or hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? And that's exactly what it was. I praise God for this verse, I can put my hand up where it says, hast thou seen the doors of the shadow of death? I have. That's my testimony. I have seen the doors of the shadow of death. They are movable. They are creepy. They're wide. They look like shadows, and they reflect death. 
And as far as I know, uh, these must be one of the entrances into hell because I knew that if I went through those shadows, there was no coming back. That they were entrances into hell. And I, yeah. Well, Anthony, I'm just, when you say that, I have heard previously from some who have experienced hell that same phenomena uh, oh, really? that they have entered it into whether it be a place of the macabre but one uh, Brian Melvin had indicated that this was a deceptive place that they were trying to showcase it as a kind of a resort of sort but anyway both both your uh, account and others that I've heard is that there is some gateway we we we've heard of the gate the uh, uh, the gates to heaven yes. but this is a way station if you will Yes. to hell that you're describing yes. that there That's is right. a place there and, yeah. and did you have any sense even as a child and when looking back now as you're as you prayed about it and grown and and saw it after the lord's wisdom uh that this was a way station where you had some ability to call upon the name of the Lord. In other words, that you weren't, once you entered into the lake of fire, I mean, you're, you're sealed. Um, did you, did you have any indication as to why you were in this horrid macabre place that you described? Well, I knew that I was a sinner because years prior to that, I had stolen money from my mom's purse to buy snacks at the top tuck shop at school. So um, I, I knew it was because of sin. And uh, if I could just relate one part of this testimony now, I was very scared. I was resisting this tractor beam to go towards those shadows, the doors of the shadow of death. And I was met by a demonic creature. Now, interestingly, uh, in Kenneth Hagen's testimony, he speaks about being met by a demonic creature as well. So I can relate to that part of his testimony and the part about falling down the well. But I saw this creature. I saw it. It, it, it was hideous. It had a very big head with cancerous lumps, weeping sores on it. And my understanding was that this, this was sin. This was some kind of, um, it's hard to explain, but it grabbed me and tried to pull me to, to enter in through those shadows. And I did not know the scripture. I did not know the Bible except John 3, 3, because my dad had awoken me to that scripture. I did not know that the Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. I just, I was so scared. I just cried out, Jesus, Jesus, help. Mm. I did not know the scriptures, but I cried out to Jesus and Jesus took me out of there like suction would take just whoop out of there. And next thing I, my right hand is on a golden wall and I'm crying because of the dichotomy, the irony of being in hell and all of a sudden being in heaven in glory. I had my right hand on the golden wall and I couldn't process what had just happened. I was, I was, I was, experiencing the terrors of hell. I was about to be taken through the doors of the shadow of death. And now I'm in heaven on the outskirts of heaven with my right hand on a golden wall, a luminescent gold, gold that glows. Hmm. And I'm crying and I cannot process what has just happened, but I just have intense joy and peace and love is just flowing over me. Jesus is speaking to me. Now, I didn't see Jesus. I saw him later on. I'll talk about that. And in heaven, people don't communicate like we do. They speak telepathically. Hmm. So it seemed. So Jesus was speaking. I could hear what he was saying. And when I spoke to Jesus, I don't think I was speaking. I was just, you know, you speak from your, your soul, your spirit. And he said, this is a place I've prepared for you. Hmm. And I was like, wow, <laughs> Jesus has prepared a place for me. I want to be here. Lord, please don't send me back. And I was aware that if I didn't go back, it would be a horrible thing for my family, for my mom and dad and my younger brother and sister to lose 
their older brother, their, their, own, their firstborn son. I knew it would be horrible, but I chose to stay in heaven. And Jesus said, no, um, you can't. And I was really upset. I thought, no, Lord, I want to be here. Lord, I want to be here. You sure you said this is a place you prepared? And Jesus said, no, this will be down on the earth. What? How can this be down on the earth? That doesn't make any sense to me. <laughs> I'm in heaven. How can heaven be on earth? This is now, a, a point, I think, that's worthy of a pause, Anthony, because Thank you. he is going to tell you, or he has told you, that what you are beholding will be poured forth on earth. That's right. And, and I didn't so you had in another a kind of highlight of what you said is very poignant and echoed by others as well who have had this hell experience that have been in this place where they've cried out the name of Jesus and all of a sudden yeah. they're ushered forth. So and there's also a point that, and I'll end with this and turn it back to you, that you are, we're at this juxtaposition where he's telling you you're at that, you're at this uh, new Jerusalem, this place, this uh, wall of gold outside of heaven. And, and, and that he is, he is telling you essentially that you are now written in the book of life that you have, uh, he's prepared a place for you. Amen. But it's important, I'm sure you would um, support me in this, saying this, Anthony, that those who are watching yeah. us who don't know Jesus as the Lord and Savior, please don't count on the possibility that you will have that second chance. In other words, if you're now carousing right. and all of those things, you may not have that second chance, Amen. right? And it's important that's, to know that's that, right. um, that that he knew Amen. your heart as a child, and and uh, yes. but that's not a given that we will have each person who does not call upon the name of Jesus Christ, confess him as Lord and Savior, and uh, yeah. um, invite him to become Lord and S Lord of your life. Uh, that if you don't do that before you, that heart stops or or you leave this world. Yep. No, you got to be prepared right now. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I like to say, uh, people say be rapture ready, uh, but I say be death ready. Ah, I like that. <laughs> be death ready. <laughs> I like Cause in, that. Because historically, everybody that was waiting for the rapture, well, they died anyway. So it's better to be death ready. Praise the Lord. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to be there so much. And it wasn't until later in life that I read in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verse 2, uh, John says, And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And when I got an image of that, I realized it's fantastic that that had happened, that I now had this realization that, I was on the uh, very, I was on the, my, my mansion was on the wall, literally like, uh, it was like, I just made it. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that was my, my impression was I just made it. Uh. Yeah. Praise the Lord. And so from there, the Lord took me. Um, I know this part of the testimony sounds very strange, unusual, but the Lord to the strange part now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, that tells us a lot. Hang on to your seats. <laughs> yeah. He, the Lord was, God is big. Jesus was standing or behind the moon. And all I could see was his hair. It was white. And I read in the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter one, verse 14, it said, his head and his hairs were like white wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire. I didn't see his eyes. I imagine if I did, I probably would have died. I mean, it's just God is so powerful. And Jesus opened up a vision in space and showed me my life of things to come, and I wasn't paying attention because I was admiring 
the beauty of the earth from the moon, I was captivated by this beautiful, illuminescent blue marble, like technicolor. You know, this, this would have been back in the, in the, in the 1970s. No, sorry, 1983. And it, it, it was incredible. And I think the Lord was like, hey, I'm trying to show you something. And I was looking at the earth, how beautiful it was. And the Lord showed me um, in a vision. Now, I was so excited. I had just gotten born again at a Pentecostal meeting. And I wanted to be just like the evangelist, Steve Ryder. I said, I'm going to be an evangelist. I'm going to tell everybody about you. And Jesus said, no, you're not called as an evangelist. And I don't remember what he said, but I remember that whatever it was, I couldn't remember what that was. He, he might have said a uh, pastor. I'm not sure at the moment. I'm unofficially the assistant pastor of a Thai church in Thailand. Uh, where I'm here preaching and that's the gospel. Broad, you're broadcasting from Thailand right now. That's correct. I'm in uh, north eastern Thailand, 110 miles from the Burmese border in a village, a Yumian village, a tribal village. Uh, my wife is from the Yumian tribe. And uh, I've been in Thailand now for 20 years, and uh, it's been miraculous. Uh, God's been with us the whole time and leading us and guiding us and correcting us. And so going back to the vision, the Lord showed me in the vision things that would happen. For example, the first thing he showed me was that I would have a car accident and damage my arm. Now, for the medical personnel out there, this is called a fracture of the medial epicondyle and a compound of the humerus. I'm a former critical care nurse. That was my profession. I knew God gave me that when I was a little boy. My mom and I, my mom took me up to visit somebody at the Princess Alexandra Hospital in Brisbane. And I knew back then, I thought, this is, a, this is great. I, mean, what a, I, I knew in my, my soul that this would be my career. And I, it was a very blessed career. So I had... I saw that I damaged my elbow in the car accident and that came to pass, although I didn't understand it until I was 32 and I'll get to that part. And then the Lord showed me the sin. I would fall into pornography addiction. I would become addicted to pornography and I was shocked when I was 15 years old. I'm like, no, Lord, no, I would never do that. But God knows everything. He knows the beginning from the end. He showed me the future that I would preach the gospel, uh, which we do in public places. We go to markets and uh, in Bangkok, bus stops, uh, preach in Thai churches on invitation. And so, praise God, that part's right. I mean, I basically, I had to become an overcomer. I did overcome. And um, Jesus told me that it wouldn't be easy. In other words, that's why Jesus said, strive to enter in. Even though we're saved now, the Bible says seven times in the book of Revelation in chapters two and three, the promises are for, to him that overcometh. We have to overcome. So um, that's why Paul said, you know, I've ended with, I fought the good fight. But amen. also, you know, he said, you know, I, and I'm paraphrasing now. He said, I, I do the things I don't want to do. The things I want to do sometimes I don't do. So there's that struggle this That's right. To persevere and fight, fight that fight. Good fight. Exactly. Romans chapter 7, Paul said, In my flesh, flesh dwelleth no good thing. But he identified that the sin was in his members. But he said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. Because it is not the flesh that is born again. It is the real us, the inward man. Yes. So praise That's God for that. That's an important distinction that, you know, because a lot of people are trying to get saved in the flesh. Right. You know, by, yes. by living a religion of good works or a life of good works, which never gets you to that point. No one That's can right. be good enough. In fact, Jesus right. said, said a righteousness is filthy rags. The good, the rich man asked Jesus how he could get into the kingdom of God. And, and uh, he basically said to Jesus, he followed the Ten Commandments. He said, I'm a good man. And, and Jesus said, no one is good but God. No one. Amen. That, that's right. And of course, in Romans chapter 8, Paul then clarifies and tells us how we get the victory. In Romans chapter 8, verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, which walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. So, you know, with by God's grace, he helps us uh, get the victory. 
And so I basically, I, I backslid after that because my, my eyes were not focused on the Lord. I was seeing about the bad things that were happening in the churches at the time. And I thought the people in church were the saints of God. So when people would bicker and fight, when one pastor was accused of something and another went to another church, another pastor, a misappropriation of funds. Well, I was very young and innocent at 15 years old. I was very young at heart and I fell away and I was very disappointed. And of course, I fell into sin. I wanted to have a girlfriend. I wanted to uh, fornicate and I was backslidden. But in the 17 years I was backslidden, God always sent a messenger, somebody to talk to me, to tell me Jesus still loves you. Come back to the Lord. It's not too late. So I kept Jesus locked up in my heart, knowing that he was real, but wanting to live my life without the Lord as a hypocrite. I admit I was a hypocrite. Um, but I didn't, I wasn't a hypocrite to the point where I was going to church and pretending to be a Christian. I knew I was not living a Christian life. And then, you know, as the Bible says, the way of transgressors is hard. As you backslide, the more you backslide, the more bad things happen to you. Until one day, uh, things got very bad. I had an accident. I was bleeding out. And I actually thought at that time, that I was going to, I was going to, I was thinking about topping myself. I thought, I can't believe I'm a successful, um, a university graduate, a bachelor's master's degree, a top of my league in my job as an ICU nurse, a clinical nurse in intensive care, popular, had lots of friends. But you know, when you become a Christian, you lose a lot of friends and family. Mm -hmm. And uh, it takes a sacrifice to be a Christian. And I made some big sacrifices in my life. I knew that I, there's things that I had to get done. I went to bed sobbing, not normal crying, like a, a belly cry, like deep sorrow, just sobbing because my ex-wife had taken my son away in violation of a family law court order, so I couldn't see my, my baby boy at the time. I was depressed. I was becoming suicidal. And I was sobbing. I was crying. And then I had this experience. Now, the Bible says in Psalm 30, verse 5, weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. I was weeping. I was sobbing. I had was not in my heart. I was I was crying out to God for help, but I didn't believe God would help me. I didn't believe it. And then in the middle of the night, I was overcome by this feeling of penetrating love and joy and peace that completely healed me, took all my depression away, suicidal thoughts. I mean, it just went from complete sorrow to complete joy. I, I opened up my eyes. I could not see my bedroom. I saw Jesus hmm. as a bright shining light shining down from heaven into my bedroom. I saw it was like it was a body in a circle of light shining down from heaven. And I was in a trance. I was fixated. I could not stop looking at Jesus. I could have looked at Jesus forever. Praise God, we will get to look at Jesus forever. And it just, it just completely healed me. Everything that was wrong with me, it healed me. And when the vision left, when, when, G, when that light left, now I was amazed that light could travel so far. I knew it was coming from heaven. I knew that heaven is approximately the center of the galaxy, which, as you can see from astronomy, an area of great luminosity, in what they call uh, Sagittarius A, that region. Now, it takes something like 22,000 light years just to get, there. Mm -hmm. So when Jesus comes, I mean, he's coming faster than the speed of light. And I was amazed that light could travel that far and be so bright, be blindingly bright. And when I came out of the trance, I sat up, all the memories flooded into my mind, into my soul, what had happened after I called on Jesus to save me. Now, so that's how I knew about the rest of the vision, but it was locked up in my head. And I looked down and my pajama shirt was wet with saliva because my mouth had been open. 
looking at this vision, it, mm. it, it, it uh, caused my pajama shirt to be wet. And I jumped out of bed. I started fasting and praying. I got into God's word. The people thought I was having a mental episode. It's just Anthony's gone crazy. He's become a religious nut. He's preaching to everybody. And you and were so I'm just this time, Anthony? I was 32. 32. When this happened, I went to work. I was in intensive care. I couldn't stand it anymore. I kept preaching to all my patients. A woman was dying. I took a Gideon's Bible. I put it in her hand. She was on the ventilator. She was dying. I prayed for her. Mm. The nurses were looking at me like, "Who? What, how dare you? You know, what are you doing, you fanatic?" The, the relatives were there. They were they were humbled. They they really appreciated that they had a nurse that was praying for their dying mother. And I prayed for her because when this patient, I had this patient was dying on the ventilator. When she was dying. And I see this a lot in intensive care, people that are going to hell, when they actually come out of their body and they go down, it is so shocking that they actually, there's a spring effect, they come back into their body, and they wake up. And she cried out in agony like I knew that she was going down. So I prayed for her, Lord have mercy upon her. I believe that even though the body is dying, you know, your, your spirit is awake, wide awake, 24 seven. And after that, there was a peace and she passed away peacefully. Mm -hmm. You know, I got her right at the end. And then that made me start to believe even more and more. This is real. We need to be saving souls. We need to be preaching mm -hmm. the gospel. And the hospital, that particular hospital, I was working for a nursing agency. They would call me out to work in, in different ICUs around Brisbane. They canceled me. They, they thought Anthony's gone crazy. He's a religious nut. They canceled me. Mm. But I've had many experiences now. Eventually, the Lord uh, led me out. The Lord, um, I said, God, what do you want me to do? The Lord, I was reading the Bible. Scriptures were, were jumping out of the Bible. Jesus was saying to me, it was like he was speaking to me through his word. He was saying, go ye into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in. Uh, so, so I prayed. I said, God, what do you want me to do? Well, it began, I went to... A church at the time, it was called the COC Christian Outreach Center in Mansfield in Brisbane. I was at a meeting and a young lady, an attractive young lady came and spoke to me. Now, I thought that's unusual. I look like something the cat dragged in. Why would a, a beautiful young lady talk to me? And she said, you know, I've got relatives in Thailand, my uncle and auntie, they're missionaries in Thailand, blah, 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 Thailand, Thailand, Thailand. And I just kept looking at it thinking, uh, you know, like, what do I do? I'm still in the flesh now. I'm thinking, what do I, should I get a number, you know? <laughs> and she said to me, you should go to Thailand. Why don't you go to Thailand? And I'm like, me? Go to Thailand? So eventually I kept fasting and praying and I had a vision. God showed me in a vision. And in a vision, I crossed a body of water and I saw the Southeast Asian archipelago between Australia and Thailand. Now I knew about that. My dad had seen that when he was little. My dad was born and raised um, in Indonesia, what they used to call Batavia. He was in a hut and he had come out of his body. He had uh, almost died of malaria and he floated above his body and he'd seen the Southeast Asian archipelago. I just want to throw this in as a side note my dad saw demons floating around the hut, but they couldn't touch him because he was an innocent child. But when the movie Gremlins came out, my dad was like, that's it. That's them. Mm. He said, if you want to know what devils look like, they look like gremlins. Mm. Except, of course, they come in different shapes and sizes. So that was my dad's testimony. So I came to Th I saw in a vision that I went to Thailand. Praise the Lord. I had prayed. I had been to the Bible bookstore in my hometown. At the time, it was called the Word Bookstore. And up on the shelf, they had different Bibles up there, the ESV, the NIV, the Amplified, the, the uh, I think the Living Translation, the New King James, the King James. I said, Lord, which one is the best? Now, uh, I'm not here, you know, to, as, you know, to, I apologize. If you want to edit this part out, sorry. 
No, no. Um, I, I, well, that's that's a good point. I mean, people oftentimes ask, "What Bible uh, translation should I use?" Right. So, and, so, um, so what happened was, um, I asked God which one, and uh, in the vision, I saw in the vision there was a long vision, uh, but one part of the vision was that um, I was given uh, a black covered book, and in the vision. The Holy Spirit said two things. The person that gave it to me, the Holy Spirit said he's faithful. And he happens to be a preacher. Uh, he doesn't like to be called a street preacher, but at the time he was training me up. I'm sorry, I'm jumping the story here a little bit. In the vision, the Lord said that this was a guidebook. It was a black covered book and that this would be a guidebook for your life, that you need this as a guidebook. Now, when I came to Thailand, I completely forgot about the vision, that part of the vision. And I had no money. I'd actually borrowed money from my mom. I was such a problem for the family at that time. They just wanted to get rid of me. So she was quite happy to give me the money to leave. So I came to Thailand completely. I didn't even have faith. How could I survive? It was by grace, by God's grace that I could survive in the beginning living in a in a dive place with refugees it's quite a harrowing that's another part of my testimony but I'm, I'm, i won't, i don't want to share that part now but i had been in thailand now for almost a year i started uh, teaching english and uh i met an evangelist and a street preacher who used to be a thai boxer on thai tv a prize fighter and he got saved he got born again and he, the lord had him meet me as though it was a divine appointment and he took me under his wing and showed me the ropes the do's and the don'ts this is how you do it be careful of this be careful of that Tai, he understands he speaks thai because he went to high school here he knows thai culture and so the lord used him to train me up in the ministry for about one year And then there came a point in time where I wanted a Bible for somebody and he gave me his Bible. And when he gave me his Bible, I noticed that it was a black covered book. And then that part of the vision, I, rec I remember that part of the vision, my eyes were open. I was like, oh, wow, I remember this. This is the guidebook. I asked God which version is the best version in the English language, and God answered my prayer. And when I realized God had answered my prayer, I, I cried. I couldn't stop crying. I wrote the date down that I received this from the evangelist. It was the 7th of December, 2003. And with the note here, with the details of it, God gave me his word. That's why I use the King James Bible. And interestingly, I noticed that the New American Standard is now coming in line with the King James. I don't know if people realize that, but if you look up scriptures, doctrinally speaking, the New American Standard is now getting it right. Praise the Lord. Yeah. yeah so sometimes uh, the King James Version Some have difficulty reading it because there are a lot of these right. owls and shells yeah. and what have you. But um, it's not the, the, the vernacular. It is the how the King James Bible was, was, uh, was scribed. Right. Uh, as one yes. of the original. Uh, not a, it, was, it was the closest to the original as the scribes right. were passing it down. Exactly. And so the translations yeah. were to help people actually in a vernacular that they could perhaps better comprehend That's you right. know, synonyms, using synonyms and the like. But, you know, yep. what I'll do is I'll read the King James Version. And if I want to break a, a relevant point that's more of a conceptual, uh, mm -hmm. I might use uh, another, you know, uh, anyway, mm -hmm. we're getting into the kind of the weeds of it. But where we're going. Right. With this is the new Jerusalem coming to this earth. So he's got a revelation, God, that is for you, Anthony, that That's right. he goes, brings you back to heaven. But we're getting, we're leading into that because you are uh, a relatively a new believer on fire for the Lord in yes. as a missionary now in Thailand. And, right. uh, 
and you're getting steeped in the word. Right. Well, the, the church said, Anthony, you need to go to Bible school. You know, you need to save up money. And, and I couldn't, I couldn't, I, the Lord gave me this vision. I had to run with it. And I remember a testimony by Reinhard Bonnke where he was waiting on the Lord and God said to him, Africa shall be saved. Africa shall be washed in blood. And God said to him, if you drop this vision, I will drop you. So I thought, I don't have time to keep working and save up and go to Bible school and graduate. I'm going. The Bible says, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. I just want to quickly add, by the way, um, Reverend Silverside, he's going to be with the Lord, but I, I saw him in Brisbane. And I just want to quickly add that the former translations are not dissimilar. Right, So the Coverdale Bible, Tyndale's Bible, the Bishop's Bible, Matthew's Bible, the Great Bible, it's the same Bible. They're all Protestant Bibles. They all come from Erasmus's Rotterdamus's uh, uh, Latin Greek. And if you look at the Latin Vulgate in the third century, it's the same Bible. It's that line that is the line which they actually originally called the Antiochian texts, also known as the ecclesiastical texts, the Syrian texts, the majority texts. There's many names for it, but it's different from the Alexandrian. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that in there to say that this is the this is the vine. Praise the Lord. Um, I came to Thailand. I was like a fish out of water. I didn't have faith. I didn't. I hardly knew the Bible, but God miraculously took care of me. And you know, as a father would raise a child, so to speak. And in the back of my mind now, all the things that had transpired were an encouragement to me. And the reality, and this is the strange thing, um, I, I was going to say Brother Randall or Pastor Randall, I'm not sure. Well, uh, my my uh, formal name is, is Randolph. Not, I don't think, think oh. anybody, anybody probably knows that. But yeah, oh, sorry, I go by Randy. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Sorry. Not at all. Yes. Um. Now I lost my thoughts. <laughs> uh, it, it, it's been an exciting journey. We were talking um, about the uh, King James and how literal the translation is. And so I think when we're thinking about that, our names, you know, Anthony is is a, a your your birth name, I assume. And anyway, but we're yes. going out a little bit tangentially now uh, back to you are deep diving into the Bible, learning as a as a new believer, uh, essentially. Yes. Yeah, so what struck me was many Christians that I met back in my hometown when I went back uh a couple of times i went back home for different reasons uh they did not it seemed like they didn't have much understanding of the millennial period or they could not conceptualize the reality of this enormous heavenly city that's coming onto the earth that towers way above the International Space Station, I think five times higher than the International Space Station, towering into space itself. And I'd had, a, I suppose it was like a flash vision one time. I even saw what it looked like from Thailand. It is breathtaking, the size of this thing. It's like, well, I don't want, I shouldn't use this reference in Star Trek, a ball cube, you know, <laughs> that would be the antipathy of it. But uh, it, it is huge. I mean, have you seen the area? Have pe Christians don't realize the size of it? It takes up nearly, if you had to, if it came down on the United States of America, it would, it, the, the diameter would cover almost the whole country for size. Yeah, and it's, and it's a misconception when we talk about the New Jerusalem you know, the, the, uh, in heaven, that it will be established on earth. We think of Jerusalem, the city in Israel, but, right. but far grander and more oh, magnificent yes. than that. I think we kind of That's lose right. context when we try to ascribe yeah. it to the city yeah. of Jerusalem. Yeah, that's interesting because um, in Jerusalem, you know, like in where the Rock of the Dome is, there are some, I don't know, exactly whether it's true or not but some people say that they believe that that's where god created adam in jerusalem i, I don't really know if that's true or not but what we do know 
is that God has chosen Jerusalem to put his stamp there, to put his heavenly city there, and all the land of Canaan that he had given to Abraham and the patriarchs is is by God's will and God's providence that he has done that, and he will complete it by sending a glorious city down from heaven. It is so exciting. Just makes you want to shout, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, everything that's done in heaven is far greater than anything that's, right. that's been uh, man-made or human-made on, on earth. And yeah. it, what's interesting is you, he's given you a depth of perception and all of these things uh, that are happening, happening uh, not just futuristically, but heaven establishes first that which is established. God calls into being life uh, that which is already established from the creator on his throne in heaven. So, um, so, so he was connecting you to what you had saw, seen earlier as a young man at the age of 15 that's right and, and now he was connecting you and bringing to your mind and understanding what you had beheld as a teenager young teenager that's right and another scripture that really spoke to me before i came to thailand when the lord had given me the vision at about that time the bible says in uh in matthew chapter 19 verse 29 and everyone that hath forsaken houses or brethren or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my name's sake shall receive an hundredfold and shall inherit everlasting life now i didn't care about the hundredfold but i thought who would say such a thing like this only god could say such a thing everlasting life those two words got a hold of me immortality i can live forever because society is looking for the fountain of life. And the Bible says in the book of Psalms that with the Lord is the fountain of life. They make movies about finding the Holy Grail, like Indiana Jones, you know, Harrison Ford, all those movies about, you know, finding the, the Lord's chalice, finding the Holy Grail. There's a lot of Chinese movies about finding the elixir of life that you could live forever. And here it is right here. We don't have to die. We can be immortal. We can live forever. It is so exciting. What we have is so precious. You could not put a, a value on it. Nothing in the world could compare to the value of eternal life that God has promised us through his word, through his son, Jesus Christ. Mm. And so that's why I preach everywhere I go. I tell people about it here in a very... Uh, incredulous uh, people here given over to idolatry and harlotry. Uh, people's hearts and minds are closed to the gospel, but we're still going to preach uh, no matter what happens because God desires for all men to be saved. As the old saying was, God save the elect and then save some more. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. Well, the, the, yes, uh, I like that. Um, so this is this is both from the Daniel book of Revelation, um, kind of last days, end times, kind of ch chapters from from or uh, accounts from from those books and Matthew, uh, Ezekiel. Uh, so did God elucidate to you then, Anthony, the temple that you saw? Because you went from this story began when you as a child were in this. What do, what do we term it now? This kind of I call it a way station place to hell. That is, a, you know, yes. before hell, this place. And there were, you know, skins hanging on the wall. And you you reference the scriptures that actually uh, talk about that that appearance right. literally. Right. Um, so we've gone from that macabre view in hell to now we're at the golden walls of heaven, 
Yeah. The, the New Jerusalem, the celestial city, which is also referenced in the Bible as, right. the, you know, the New Jerusalem, the temple uh, in, in heaven being poured forth on earth. So any elucidation from the Lord as to why he had revealed this to you and any correlation with any of the end time events within the Bible? Well, I believe that the Lord showed me this to encourage me as an encouragement because I had my right hand on the wall of the mansion that the Lord had prepared for me. And I asked the Lord, are there others here? He said, yes, you can join them later. And looking up, it's like an incline. The streets of heaven are made of gold, illuminous and gold. There were other mansions far more majestic. So my understanding is that uh, there are rewards in heaven and that there are people that are, you know, have greater mansions in heaven, I suppose. And um, and that uh, this is fantastic. I mean, it puts new meaning to, you know, the kingdom of heaven is coming it literally is the kingdom of heaven is literally coming down onto this planet yeah and there and and the, the bible talks about an, an, a new earth right a new uh, heaven and a new earth so the yeah. establishment of that so that not celestial city so much as the what the bible references is the shining city on the hill right um the shining city being that which is established in heaven now um, we've had a former president who called America the shining city on the hill. Uh, you know, that that's not quite accurate in terms of the Bible uh, description of, of that, which is a which is a celestial city. So that new earth people, you know, the thousand year reign and all that we won't get into the millennium and those things unless you want to uh, touch on that. But that is an establishment of what what will happen. Um, And so he was showing this to you, the mansions. I know people get sometimes fixated on, well, I I want a palace of Versailles. Trade in my, you know, my rundown apartment for the palace (laughs) of Versailles. But, you know, anything in heaven that's created is greater than anything on earth. Let's put it that way. Amen. Right? Amen. So wherever you're going... (laughs) <laughs> it's going to be better than what you've got here. Um, yeah. No matter how, how, how big your mansion is. However, you talked about something of, of, of works and rewards, not of, apart from salvation, the rewards in heaven, but there are also other rewards, which is an intimacy with the Lord, Lord God Almighty, yeah. because you describe yeah. in your experience that that's really what mattered most to you. That's right. Spiritual blessings, which we can get by spending time in prayer and seeking the Lord. Uh, they're, they're the far more weightier and essential blessings or spiritual blessings. Yeah. And also it gives you assurance of salvation too, as well. When you're close to the Lord, it helps a lot of people nowadays. They, some people doubt their salvation. They don't have assurance of salvation. And i I would recommend for them to, you know, spend time in God's word and in prayer. As the Bible says, uh, lay hold upon eternal life. It is, it is, as you said, you know, fight the good fight of faith. Um, you see, um, people, or well, they always debate, you know, people want to debate between the Cal- Calvinist position and the Arminian position. And, uh, you know, the truth is that, the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith and not of works, lest any man should boast. But notice you have to have faith in order to have grace. Mm-hmm. So faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So it is the good word of God, the seed, which is planted in the heart, which then brings forth fruit. One, one waters, one plants another waters, but God gives the increase. Mm-hmm. And so now are we saved? As the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Once we're saved, God has a plan for our life. He has something that we need to find out. What does God want us to do? Exactly. And in my case, God was leading me to forsake everything. And the easy part was I didn't have much to forsake. The hardest thing was to forsake my baby boy, Angelo, uh, 
that was difficult. But the Lord showed me in a dream that it was necessary for me to go forth and preach the gospel and that I would meet him later. I saw in a dream I embraced my son, and that came true. I saw my son finally when he was growing up, about 13 years old. Just as I saw in the dream, I met my son and I gave him a hug. So God has a plan, and for me to be saved, because the Bible says not everyone that saith that be Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, God's will for my life is to be here. I don't actually don't like living here. It's very hot. There's many mosquitoes, scorpions, and centipedes, and uh, there's persecution and that. So the flesh doesn't like it. But you know, as I say, a little suffering is good for the soul. But this is what this is God's will for me. God's will was for me to forsake everything, to come here, to live in the middle of nowhere, on the backdrop of these hills, which is just all jungle and bush and preach the gospel in the highways and the hedges, which is what we do. And although we've only seen a little fruit, in time that seed that's been planted will be watered and more fruit will come. And in fact, I'm preaching over an area of over 3,000 square miles in an area in northeastern Thailand called Gumpang Province. I'm the only one. I have seen nobody else out there except one missionary, Uh, I think he's from California. He's the only other missionary I've met. Now, I don't call myself a missionary because I wasn't sent by a church. I came independently. I've always supported myself. And then after leaving my job, uh, uh, eventually I got a job as a science teacher uh, working at Assumption College. When I left that, the Lord showed me that I could live by faith. And miraculously, God has been supplying my need. As the Bible says, my God shall supply on all of your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We live by faith. Mm -hmm. Even though my wife only earns 300 US dollars a month working for the village church, and yet we receive miraculously God. It's like, you know, the ravens. God just sends blessings Mm -hmm. coming through. So it's been a, a miraculous journey. It's been a supernatural spiritual journey the whole time it is exciting and um yeah I'm, every day is a blessing mm. well you reflect uh his presence anthony and thank you god bless you and we pray for uh your continued uh blessings and anointings in uh, thailand there that uh all uh, with whom you meet would be saved, healed, and they would sense the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Is and uh, so we pray for also plead the blood of Jesus Christ over you, your wife, and uh, those uh, uh, that are your adopted family there around you in uh, in Thailand and uh, over your son you. as well. Um, so as as we draw this to a conclusion, Anthony, and this has been a tremendous blessing. We started in in hell, yeah, uh, and then uh, post your near death experience, there is now you are in full time uh, ministry. But That's I right. want to just express one caveat for those who are viewing this: each of you is in full time ministry too wherever Amen. you're at, you know? yep. <laughs> whether you're yep. in a penthouse and, uh, and wherever New York city or whether you're in the farmlands of, uh, you know, Thailand, you're drafted as a believer in Jesus Christ. So Amen. we want to invite those who do not have that personal relationship with Jesus. And you're thinking, I don't know if I'm saved or not. Well, when you're saved, you know, you're saved because Amen. you just have that confirming uh, af- uh, the affirming understanding that you have a now uh, our c- a closeness to the Lord. You are truly born again. So if you haven't, uh, we invite you to pray. Uh, Jesus, went, uh, he went to the cross of his own volition. Um, yes, he was sentenced, but he could have called legions of angels. And so, yeah. you know, you've sinned. Each of us has sinned. No one is pure. Uh, except maybe purified through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, which is an impartation that doesn't make you perfect uh, on this earth, at least. Uh, but by with a contrite heart, that is one of yeah. surrender, 
one of acknowledgement and true repentance by saying something yep. to the effect of, Lord, you know, I have sinned. I've fallen short. Yep. And I, I need you desperately. I, I, I need you as my Lord and Savior so I confess my sins. Amen. I confess my sins, and I yep. and I invite you now to take possession of me with your Holy Spirit to become Lord of my life, Lord Jesus Christ. You are my Lord, my God, my everything at this point, and so guide yep. me with your Holy Spirit all the days of my walk, life. So, so that's the walk of Christ now. When you're born anew through Christ, as <laughs> as uh, you had referenced, yeah. Anthony. So I'm going to leave it now. Uh, to you with any parting words or any additions or clarifications of your story. And then I'm going to invite you uh, to pray for our audience. Okay. Thank you. It's been an honor. Um, I have been watching your show uh, quite a few testimonies over the years. So I was quite taken back when I got the opportunity to share here on, uh, cause everybody I know, uh, has heard of uh, Randy K, your channel. And so people back in Australia, they're very excited when I said that I that uh, Randy K is going to interview me, praise the Lord. So it's been a tremendous honor. I just wanted to say nowadays people bag the sinner's prayer, but for me it was a very special time in my life, answering the altar call and saying the sinner's prayer. I think it's a great start. Um, when I said the sinner's prayer, because I believed it in my heart, I believe I was, I knew I was born again because I sprung out of bed the next day. I was a completely different person because I believed what I said. So I don't take sides when people want to bag the sinner's prayer. I think it's a great start. If people want to get born again, yes, they should say, they should say the sinner's prayer. They should be repentant for, you know, about their sins. Praise God. Uh, also, what's important for us, and yes, the reality of the new Jerusalem, praise God for that, but what's up next is the rapture. We, we need to be ready yes. because Jesus Christ is coming again. He's coming to take away his church, and Jesus warns us. He said, uh, when the Son of Man come, uh, comes again, will he find faith on the earth? Now, that's a rhetorical question. The answer is not much. So we need to be prepared. We don't want to be lukewarm. We want to be zealous for the Lord. We want to fight the good fight of faith. We want to make sure that we are accepted in the beloved, early to bed, early to rise, get up and pray. Pray like there's no tomorrow because tomorrow may not, you may not have tomorrow. As uh, Wanda Jackson used to sing, um, Yesterday is gone, sweet Jesus. Tomorrow may never be mine, you know. We don't know what's coming around the corner, um, but praise the Lord. It is It is glorious. It is exciting to be a Christian. And, uh, you know, stay in prayer, stay in the word, early to bed, early to rise, get up early, pray, spend time in prayer, worship God, pray through the Our Father. Uh, God will bless your life tremendously and you can be a witness to other people as well and tell people about the lord jesus christ so that seed from the word of god that jesus is the same yesterday today and forevermore and the bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the lord shall be saved praise the lord mm -hmm. we have eternal life right here god has given us a book we can have eternal life and this is so exciting. Sometimes I, I meet people in church and I wonder if they if they actually even believe it, that we can be immortal, immortality. It, it just seems fantasical almost. Like it seems like a, a, a fantasy story. And yet it's a reality that God sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to be the propitiation for our sins, to be the sacrifice for our sins. So uh, do you want me to pray for people now in the body of Please Christ? Please do, yes. Thank okay, you. thank you, Father God, for this honor to be here uh, on uh, Randy Kay's ministry, Lord God. We thank you, Lord God, for directing our lives, for saving us by thy Son, Jesus Christ, Lord God. The time draweth nigh, Father God. We ask, Lord God, 
that you strengthen the body of Christ, Lord, that you give us a heart's desire for thee and for thy word, for prayer, Lord God, that you keep our feet on the straight and narrow, Lord God, that we may be worthy to stand before the Son of Man, Lord God, that our names not be removed from the book of life, Revelation 5, 3, or 3, 5, Father God, that you keep us on the straight and narrow, keep us focused on Jesus Christ and your will for our life, Father God, that our lives be presented every day as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto thee, which is, which is our reasonable service, Lord God. Keep us under the shadow of your wings, Lord God. Protect us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So, Anthony, thank you so much for lifting us up, taking us out of hell <laughs> and into heaven and into a place where we can look forward to being, uh, being in heaven one day. Uh, and for some of us, uh, again. So, uh, certainly the uh, gates of hell shall not prevail. And, Amen. Uh, and those of you who are indeed in Christ Jesus... We have some great news. Be of good cheer because heaven is in your future. Take care. Amen. And Praise the Lord. Bless. It's been an honor. God bless you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe. And if you'd like further information, go to our website at randyk.org, where our mission is simple, to share the great news of God's love.